Hi, in this video, we're gonna actually get into the real story behind electron configuration. Um, last unit, we talked more about kind of the basics of electron configuration, and I left a lot of the story untold. In this video, we're gonna kind of have the full explanation of what's actually going on with these electrons. How are they laid out within an atom? And I wanna just start with a refresher about the fact that an atom is made up of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and the electrons are outside the atom, kind of orbiting around outside, in places that we think are pretty likely for an electron to be. These seven rings are called shells, and they are regions where an electron can be found around a nucleus in an atom. And in this video, we're really only talking about electrons, we're not focusing on protons and neutrons in that nucleus. And I actually really would just like to focus on the first four shells. Each shell has a number of subshells in it, which are more precise locations. The first shell, the smallest shell, the one that's closest to the nucleus, has only one what we call S subshell. A subshell is something that's contained within a shell and each shell has at least one. Now the first shell only has one. The second shell has an S subshell, but it also has a P subshell, which is a little bit bigger. The third shell has an S, a P, and a D subshell. A D subshell is even bigger than a P. And then the fourth shell has four uh, subshells in it. It has an S, a P, a D, and an F subshell. And of these four subshells, F is the biggest. So let's look at this a slightly different way. An S subshell can hold only two electrons, a P subshell can hold six, a D subshell can hold 10 electrons, and an F subshell can hold 14. Now if you look closely, there's a, a bit of a pattern here. Uh, as we move from S to P to D to F, we're able to hold four more electrons than the previous subshell. And there's a reason for that. Each subshell contains a certain number of orbitals. An orbital is something within a subshell that contains up to two electrons. Okay, so let's pause for a second and take inventory of all the information that we just heard. We heard that there are seven shells around a nucleus. And this is where the electrons live. But within each of the seven shells, there's a different number of subshells. And within each of the subshells, there's a different number of orbitals, and orbitals are really where the electrons can be. Think of it this way. A shell could be like a town, a subshell could be like a road in that town, and an orbital might be one of the houses on that road in the town. You can see as I kind of zoom in from shell to subshell to orbital, I'm talking about a more specific location. An address has a number on a street in a city. And so you can think of a, uh, an orbital as the number, the subshell as the street, and then the shell itself, one through seven, as the city where all of this is located. Hopefully that helps. Now let's continue. The S subshell has only one orbital, and if only one orbital can fit two electrons, then the S subshell can only fit two electrons in it. The P subshell has three orbitals, and that's what allows it to fit six electrons. Two orbitals, or two electrons per orbital, three orbitals, two times three is six. The D subshell has five orbitals, that's 10 electrons, and the F subshell has seven orbitals, which would equate to 14 electrons room for 14 electrons. These are all the maximum amounts of electrons that can fit in each of these uh, subshells. Okay, so let me show you this a slightly different way. A table comparing shells, subshells, orbitals, and number of electrons. And in our first shell, we only have an S subshell, which means we only have one orbital in the first shell. And that's why in the first shell we can only fit two electrons. The maximum amount of electrons in the first shell is two. I could have zero or one, but I can't have, or I could have two, but I can't have more than two. In this second shell, I have an S subshell, just like I do in the first shell. But there's also a P subshell, which has three orbitals in it, and that means it can hold six electrons. Now, if you add two and six together for the second shell, you end up with eight total electrons that can fit in the second shell. 
Let's move on to the third shell. I have an S and a P just like the second, but this also has a D subshell, which has five orbitals in it and therefore can hold 10 extra electrons. Now two plus six plus 10 makes 18. I think you can see where I'm going with this. Let's do the fourth shell just for good measure. That has an S, a P and a D. It also has an F, which is seven orbitals and therefore can hold 14 electrons. If you add up two, six, 10 and 14, you get 32. And these numbers here should probably be pretty familiar to you if you're thinking of kind of the first explanation of electron configuration, 2n squared, where n is the shell number. That's where that trick comes from. It's this. We really have this going on in all of these shells. So let me show you an orbital filling diagram. Um, this is a, you can think of it like it's a chart that really only has a, a, a y-axis. And that's that the lower you are in the chart, the less energy you, you are needed or you need to have in order to be there. The higher up you are, if you're an electron, that means you have to have a lot of energy to be there. Now, think of it this way. Uh, the nucleus is down here. Uh, so this is where the nucleus is. And then uh, the first shell, remember, just has one subshell and only one orbital on that subshell. That's the 1s subshell. Uh, that's got the lowest energy. If you're an electron and you're very close to the nucleus, you don't have a lot of energy. So the second subshell, the 2s subshell, is a little bit further out, and so it requires a little bit more energy to be there. Uh, the 2p subshell, with its three orbitals, is pretty close energy-wise, but it actually requires more energy to be in the 2p subshell, even though you're still talking about the same second shell, that second ring outside the nucleus. Uh, there are delineations. Now, all the orbitals in the 2p subshell all of these here, these are all at the same energy level, but 2p requires more energy than 2s does. Let's keep going. Now we've filled our, uh, our second shell. We've run to the third shell, 3s and 3p, and it's business as usual so far, but something strange happens right about here. You'd think that the 3d subshell would be the next subshell that would pop up, because if we're following our pattern, we have 1 Two, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, you'd think that we'd have 3d next. But what actually happens is it's slightly less energy to start filling the fourth shell, the 4s subshell, than it is to finish filling the 3d subshell. Let me say that differently. It's easier to start filling the fourth shell even though we have more room to fill electrons in the third shell. And it's not until we filled up the 4s subshell that we then go back and kind of fill in the 3d subshell. Once we get beyond that, uh, we're now filling the 4p and then 5s, and this, this continues. So let's look at some examples because I think that the best way to learn how this works is just to look at a bunch of examples. Let's start with the most basic example, hydrogen. Hydrogen only has one electron in it if we're talking about an atom of hydrogen. So that one electron I would fill in the 1s subshell. Uh, I put it in as an arrow because electrons have a spin. And so it's helpful to just see an arrow as opposed to a dot. Uh, we'll talk more about that in just a second. But I want to start with the 1s subshell, and that's because there's a principle or a rule we have to follow, and it's called the Aufbau principle. Aufbau is German for build up. And what the Aufbau principle says is that electrons will fill the lowest energy levels first before they move on to higher energy levels. So that's why hydrogen would just have one electron in the lowest energy level, 1s, in that orbital. Now, what's the electron configuration? Well, there's a slightly different format when we know this much information about the electron configuration. We'd write it as 1s with a 1 subscript or one in the power, it almost looks like. And here's the breakdown for that. One is the shell, one through seven. S is the subshell of that shell, so one S, the one S subshell. And then the baby numbers as superscripts, those are the electrons. So one S one means that I have one electron in the one S subshell. Let's move on to helium. Helium has two electrons. So I'm gonna put one in one S, just like I did for hydrogen. I have room for another in the 1s subshell, so the other electron to make helium's two electrons is gonna go also in that 1s subshell. Now notice that arrow is pointing down, 
And there's a reason for that. That's the, and the electron configuration would be 1s2. But the reason for that arrow pointing down is the Pauli exclusion principle. And this says that electrons in the same orbital will spin in opposite directions. Keep in mind these electrons are negative and negatives don't want to be near each other if they don't have to. So spinning in opposite directions uh, makes them a little bit more comfortable. Let's move on to lithium. Lithium has three electrons in it, one in the 1s, the other in the 1s. So now I've filled my 1s, I have to move on to the next highest energy level and that's 2s. So my configuration becomes 1s2, 2s1. If you look at these baby numbers here, these superscript numbers, two and one, uh, that should always add up to three in this case. But really, I mean, generally, it should always add up to the number of electrons that you intend on putting in the configuration. So that's a way to kind of check yourself when you're done. Let's move on to beryllium. Beryllium has four electrons, two in the first shell, two in the second shell. And so this would just become 1s2, 2s2. Starting to get the hang of this. Let's keep going for another couple elements. Boron has five, so two in the first shell, two in the 2s subshell, and I'm not gonna move on to 3s because the 3s subshell requires way more energy than the 2p subshell. So I'm gonna start filling the 2p subshell. So this would become 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Okay, let's move on to carbon. Carbon has six electrons, two in the first shell, two in the 2s subshell, and then you'd think that I'd just have two electrons here in the 2p subshell. And that's true, but the way that it's drawn out here where both electrons are in the first orbital and the other two orbitals are blank, yeah, that's not going to happen. Uh, imagine getting on a bus, seeing that there's an open seat and there's a seat that has someone in it. You're going to go for the open seat before you're forced to buddy up with someone in a seat that's already occupied. This is called Hund's rule. Hund's rule essentially says that single electrons will fill each orbital in the same subshell on their own before pairing up. And so instead of having something like this, we'd have more something like that, where we'd have uh, still 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, but really we have to kind of know what's going on with these electrons here. They're spinning in the same direction and they're not going to start to buddy up until they have to. Okay, so let's uh, take a step back for a second. We've learned more about electron configuration that we have uh, a more specific maybe advanced way of saying exactly where the electrons are. And sometimes this is the point where students kind of get pretty turned around and they start to think, how am I gonna keep track of all of this? Well, there's something that can help you immensely and that's the periodic table. Let me just slide helium over to right next, next to hydrogen for a second. And then I, I wanna kind of point out there's, there's kind of four areas of the periodic table that maybe you won't be able to unsee once you see it. Let me kind of break out the periodic table a little bit. If you notice, the first major section only has two per row. And that kind of mimics the fact that in the S subshells, we can only have up to two electrons. So this tall tower here on the left, we call the S block. Um, then let's just read this like a book. Uh, top to bottom, left to right. If we look on the right side, we'd get to the right side first. That's six elements wide. And so that resembles the six electrons that can fit in a P subshell. In the center, we've got 10 elements wide and that represents the D block or the D subshell. And then of course, the bottom two rows there, that's the F block. If you count them up, there's 14 elements there. So I show you all of this to tell you that you can really use the periodic table to help you figure out what the electron configuration is for any element. Jump right into it. Let me show you uh, hydrogen uh, here. Hydrogens would be 1s1. Heliums would be 1s2. Uh, and then I'm going to just skip down to the next row here. Now I'm in the second shell of electrons. So lithium would have, this is just the end of its electron configuration, 2s1, beryllium uh, 2s2, boron 2p1, carbon 2p2, and I can keep going, p3, p4, p5, p6. Now my p subshell is filled, and what do you know, I'm also at the end of the periodic table. I now have to start over in the third row, just like I would move to the 3s subshell. 
Now, there's nothing immediately next to 3s2, so I keep going over to 3p, 1 through 6. Uh, and then I'm in the 4s subshell, but now that that's filled, I can then go back to the 3d subshell. And so that's where this 3, this d block comes from. It doesn't match the row number, but you know that that's what we're doing with these orbitals. And then I continue on with the 4p and so on. So the point here, the periodic table is incredibly helpful. And the more you practice these electron configurations, I think the, the more you'll realize that the periodic table is really, truly a, a beautiful work of art and science come together. So I do want to show you some of these electron configurations can be, get pretty long. So let's look at magnesiums. Uh, 12 electrons mean two in the first shell, eight in the second shell. That's two in 2s and six in 2p. And then two in the third shell. So the electron configuration is uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. That's a lot to say and it's a lot to write. So there's a trick I want to show you. If I just look at this piece here, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, that is the electron configuration for neon. Neon being the most recent noble gas that we would have gone through. It's at the end of that periodic table all the way to the right. And think of this like I have neon and then I just have two more electrons, one in the 3s and the other in the 3s. If I can think of this this way, then what I can do, and I'm allowed to do this, is replace the neon configuration part of this with just neon's element symbol in square brackets like this. So this is a time saver. Uh, you go to Google and type in magnesium electron configuration. It's going to show you this instead of the full 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. It's just going to show you neon 3s2. Uh, let me show you another example. Let's do bromine, 35 electrons. Oof. Well, for that, I'm just going to fill in all my electrons as it would normally fill in. I've got all the way up to 4p5. Well, this piece here from 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, that would be uh, argon. So this here is argon. Uh, and then I just pick up from where I left off. Argon, 4s2, 3d10, 4p5, just like this here. So this is called the noble gas shorthand trick um, or noble gas configuration. Uh, this is something that you want to use really when you get beyond, uh, probably when you get beyond neon, to be honest. Probably wouldn't want to use it when you get beyond helium because that's just 1s2. So let's put this all to the test. Uh, here are five atoms. I want you to just write the electron configuration down on a scrap piece of paper. Um, and I'll show you the answers once this little timer icon in the top right corner uh, goes out. Okay, so fluorine, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Notice I can kind of check this by just looking. All right, 2 plus 2 plus 5. 5 equals 9. And that's how many electrons are in a fluorine atom. When you finish writing electron configurations, I'd always recommend you check these to make sure they match how many electrons you want to put in. Uh, sodium would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. That should be a total of 11 electrons. Uh, this right here is shorthand for electron. Aluminum, 13 electrons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. Um, and then here, krypton. <laughs> Uh, this is where, in these two, I'm using the noble gas uh, shortcut. Noble gas shortcut here and here. You could have the expanded version of the uh, electron configuration for these, but these are pretty long, so you might want to use the noble gas shortcut here. Uh, now, krypton itself is a noble gas, and so sometimes I get students who ask, well, can I just put KR in brackets, because that's a noble gas shortcut? And the answer for that is, is no, you have to back up to the most recent or the previous noble gas and then continue the configuration from there, even though this is a noble gas itself. And then finally, strontium would just be two electrons past krypton, uh, krypton uh, 5s2. Okay, so tons of information in electron configuration. But for my class, why is this in the periodic table unit? It's in the periodic table unit because the periodic table helps us figure out how the electrons are laid out in the atom. And I hope this is helpful. Thank you.